telling everybody to uh, really work on their respiratory health. And I think Zvi is down here, and, and uh, he's in the anesthesiologist. And we were discussing this last, uh, I think, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, uh, about how to do this. And so um, it, it's great that this year that uh, one of the items that's being handed out are actually incentive spirometers. And um, I think, Michelle, do, did they get the instructions about that, or is that coming with the they will get it with their spirometer. Okay. So what I wanted to do today was actually do a couple of things. Um, one is that um, for people who have FOP, and um, as, as many of you know, the chest wall can be significantly affected. Uh, and it's really important to have a pulmonologist on your team. So at some point, being able to be seen by a pulmonologist, being seen uh, by a medical team who can help you sort of with the planning, uh, is, is a very valuable part. And one of the items that we sometimes recommend uh, is uh, what we call spirometry, where there's formalized testing of how well your lungs work. Uh, and this is, uh, we're, we're not talking about really complicated things, we're actually talking about a tube, which I'll show you a little bit about what we have here today. Um, but what we want is an opportunity to measure how well those lungs are working and to follow that over time. And when this actually starts really depends on uh, a lot of the clinical um, features, and so this is not something that, that we uh, necessarily want you to do immediately, but this is something that you and your doctor will, will need to work together on. What we wanted to do today was actually very briefly show you two items. One, uh, one is uh, what's well, called a peak flow whistle, so that's this item over here. Um, oh yeah. So uh, this is never a good sign when you're really big up on the screen. So, um, um, so, so this is the peak flow whistle, uh, and this is actually for children. And I'll show you a little bit about how that works. And this is actually the uh, incentive spirometer. And um, I'm going to have Kelly come up in a moment. And you, you don't need to come up quite yet, but um, for the incentive spirometer so that she can help explain exactly what we're looking for. Um, so. The general goal for anybody with FOP is really to take deep breaths, okay? And so the idea is not, it's not the exhalation part that we're interested in, it's the inhalation part, is, is making sure your lungs are expanded as much as possible. What that does is it opens up little pieces of airway down at the bottoms uh, or in the back or that might be a little bit crimped because of the positioning. But by opening that up, that allows air to come in, it gives you more oxygen, but it also prevents infection, and that's what we're interested in. In kids, trying to get kids to do incentive spirometry is not very easy, uh, and because I'll show you that in a little bit, but what we have are these peak flow meters. And so these peak flow meters are actually normally used for asthma. Um, they are designed to measure how fast you exhale, not inhale, so how fast you exhale. And the idea is when you blow on it, you will get a whistle. So um, I'm gonna set this to the very bottom, and Hopefully this will work. <laughs> okay, so you get you get a you get a whistle that, that comes out if you blow out fast enough. What we generally recommend is um, so what I noticed is that in, in this package it comes uh, you won't be able to see this but it comes set at 340, which is sort of the, the higher end of um, the peak flow. What you want to do is actually turn the green part and hold on to the the, the purple part and turn it down so that there's a number that says 100, I think it says 140, 140, uh, and there's a little arrow that points down to it. Don't lock the arrow, we're not using that, um, so you don't wanna slide the little piece down. Um, but what you, you just, it's okay, it doesn't really matter what you set it at at this point, okay? The idea is going to be to take a deep breath, hold it for about, you know, as deep as you can, hold it for about 10 seconds, and then blow through this. So it would be. Okay, and then just try to blow through. This is great for kids. Um, I use it with my four year old um, for, for other reasons. Um, but he basically just goes around the house blowing it, and, and you will probably hate me for this afterwards. <laughs> so I will apologize now. Now, um, for advanced users, once you get used to this, what you can do is actually turn this up a little bit so that the numbers you know, become like 180. And so what that means is that they have to blow a little bit harder to get the whistle, okay? 
The goal of this is not to torture somebody to trying to get the whistle, trying to get them to blow. The, the whistle is really just an incentive. Again, the idea is to make sure that they take a really deep breath and try to expand their lungs as much as possible. Uh, and so this tends to work really well with kids. The second one, I'm gonna have Kelly come up um, and help me with this one. So um, this one um, is a incentive spirometer. Some of you may have seen these before. Um, I will be the victim and I will blow on this one and Kelly will explain and point out a few things. But on the incentive spirometer facing, when you hold this, you, you use it in this direction. When, you f when you're looking at this, there's actually a um, little uh, meter here uh, which will go up when you take a deep breath. So the idea behind this is not to blow out through the incentive spirometer, but to hold it in your mouth and take a really deep breath in. That's why I need Kelly to explain this because <laughs> I won't be able to talk at the same time. Um, or I'm not supposed to be able to talk at the same time. Um, so what you want is you want to lift up this smaller, um, um, I guess, meter. And, and it says good, better, and best, okay? You want it at best because the idea is not to bring it in really fast. It's really lung expansion, as much lung expansion as you can. Um, and what will happen is this one will go up and you're trying to keep your flow rate sort of in between um, in here. Um, at, for the first couple of times, it doesn't really matter what you do. Um, just as long as it's somewhere in this range, that's fine. Um, and what will happen is that there's a white piston on this side that will go up to tell you how much volume you've inspired. There's a little slider on this side that allows you to set sort of a target. Um, don't worry about that right now. But what it, you would want to see is you want to take as deep of a breath as possible. You'll see the white piston go up and then you'll be able to set this to where exactly that was. And that's your goal. That's the idea of being able to try to inspire um, as much in as you can. Now, um, yeah, so okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I just need you to point Perfect. For, for all of those things. Okay, okay. So, all right, so the idea again is exhale, then put the, the, the end into your mouth and then inhale through this as slowly as possible. I'll see, it's been a long time since I've done this, so hopefully I'll do it right. This way? Yes. No, I don't think so. <laughs> we'll try this. We'll, we'll, so, if this doesn't work, I can. I'll be around, and so I can help out. So we can see that that white piston is rising nicely. And being so I'm assuming that's somewhere around here. Okay. Right. So ex again, exhale. Let me just point this one out. Here. And then you can see on the left that we're getting into the best zone here, which is ideal. And the white piston is rising again. Okay, so the idea behind this is not speed. It is not trying to make a sound or anything like that. It's really a slow inhalation. And this short piston just goes up a little bit. And then this white piston will go up. I, I, I don't know how it turned out. Did, 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 it, did it show up on the? Yeah, yeah. okay. okay, all right. So um, good luck with these. Um, I am, thank you, Michelle and the IFOPA for distributing these because these are actually vitally important. Um, as many of you know from the clinics, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so as many of you know from the clinics, there are many alternatives to this sort of strategy. If you like to sing, if you like to yell at your siblings, you know, things like that, that's totally good from our standpoint. We apologize from the parental <laughs> standpoint. But the idea really is deep breaths, really trying to oxygenate as much as you can in the lungs, really expanding the lungs as much as possible. So, yeah. How often do you recommend doing this with Yeah, so, um, especially the whistle blowing. <laughs> so um, as often as you think is tolerable, but um, it's really, uh, what we generally do is five to 10 sessions at a time. So five to 10 inspirations and expirations at a time. Um, so v is coming up because it probably means that he has other recommendations, but I think, I think the, really the idea is to try to do it on a regular basis. Um, certainly every day, certainly you know every couple of hours would be ideal, especially to, if you're in, in a wheelchair, you're not able to move, you know, or, or bed bound. Um, it's basically a process of trying to make sure that you expand your lungs, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis when we're walking around. It's less of an issue, but I think um, it's really for those people who um, are are not as mobile. 
Any other quick questions? Ed, right. is this on? Just one comment. So the one thing that we're trying to exercise is the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is a muscle that connects your abdomen to your chest wall. And it's important to know that this is not affected by FOP. And so by doing these exercises, you're really trying to exercise that muscle that's not affected and would not be affected by FOP. So the concern for muscle fatigue when doing these exercises is not really a concern. And, and so always try to think of fun ways to do these things. So these are tools that are available, but if there's more fun things that your kids like to do, I think definitely encourage them to do that. Yeah, I, I would echo that. Um, things like singing and swimming. Remember years ago, I, uh, we were in Australia for an FOB meeting and met uh, a woman who had FOP. She was a ret retired kindergarten teacher. And she looked at me, this goes back maybe 15 years, and she said, Fred, if you tell the youngsters one thing is singing and swimming, singing and swimming, and what, what does singing and swimming do? Singing exercises the diaphragm, increases the chest capacity. Swimming, you don't have to swim laps, just being in the pool and having the warm pool, it doesn't have to be a hot tub, uh, and having the column of water around the chest cavity makes you take it, it's incentive to take a deeper breath. It's great exercise. And again, like I showed before, that trippy faucet leads, not, uh, leads to abnormalities of the joints where the ribs join the spine that leads to abnormalities in, in expansion of the chest wall. We see that in the youngsters even before the extra bone forms. And then when the extra bone forms uh, across the ribs, of course, it, uh, it, it further limits that. And we know that you know, we're all concerned about preserving motion in the jaw and the shoulder and the hip and the knee, but it's very, very important for the health, the long-term health and longevity and, and, and good health of FOP patients to have good, as good lung capacity as possible for, later in, for, for, for in their entire life so they can get more oxygen into their body, so they can, get, uh, they can be as healthy as possible, and the heart doesn't have to pump as hard against a chest wall that doesn't expand. So th these are really important points, Ed, and I know Svi will want to comment on Good it. morning. Um, I've seen many of you, a few of you, when they in a time of need, as, as good parents, you teach your, your children save. Save for a rainy day, invest. But actually what we are talking now is investing in yourself. So you're saving and investing in your own wellness. And there's something that starts as early as possible. Because the individual progression of disease, as you heard from Dr. Kaplan, the same thing with the toe. Everyone chart his own direction and its own trajectory throughout life, how they develop, how the disease progresses, and how well they do and try to accommodate. It's a lifelong accommodation. So investing in yourself start as early as possible. I heard from, from Dr. Chow that you give the whistle to a young child in order to do this exercise. And I can tell you, I cannot underestimate how is it important? Important for the regular day that you live your life, the better you oxygenate, the better you breathe, the better your brain thinking, the better having optimistic view of life. But in a time of need, and I see the patient physiology in the operating room in a time of need when we actually take pieces of the physiology, how the brain function, how the heart function, what's the blood pressure, how the patient oxygenates. And sometimes with anesthesiologists, and we teach our residents, if the lung function or the oxygenation is not very good, what do we do? We call it recruitment maneuver. Surgery goes on, so we take the breathing system into our hands, there is always an anesthesia bag, and we squeeze the bag and hold it during surgery. And then you connect the system back, and surprise. The pulse oximeter that you see, beep, 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 it goes up, and the number change from 90 to 95 to 100. So you don't have to wait for the time of need during surgery, you do it during the regular life and day. And you heard from Dr. Shao, whenever you inhale and expand the lung, this is an exercise that we want you to do. As the disease, as I mentioned, progresses, sometimes there is a scoliosis, area of the lung that collapses, and sometimes the whole oxygenation depends on one part of the lung that's still free. 
but with a deep inhalation, you can recruit and add more open alveoli to optimize the oxygenation and the ventilation of each one of your part of the, of the lung. So as someone who watches the number and see how the body functions during endless hours of surgery and anesthesia, you can do it without being the need under surgery. Do it on a daily life. Train, invest in yourself, and trust me, it pays back. Today in medicine, when, when my generation used to go, or our parents to surgery and anesthesia, you go to the period of recovery, and we send individuals to rehabilitation. Today, we try to connect with our patient, and the sicker the patient, the frailer the patient, it's more important. Now we call it prehabilitation. Before we engage in any surgical intervention, we train the patients to do an exercise, and so when they come and need any medical intervention, they're at the best physiological time, they have the best reserve, because we have invested, and each one invested, in their own best health. And all this instrument, they seem simple, they seem sometimes stupid, but trust me, it works so well, and I can tell the difference during surgery and anesthesia, who has invested, and even the patient has its own limitation because of the disease, those who invested do so much better. It's not only the hour or two or less of surgery. The recovery is much better, so they go home faster. The chance of more oxygen you have, the chance of complications, infection and other things going down precipitously. So as I mentioned, invest in yourself, saving is good, and good luck. I'm, I'll be around during the next two days, happy to answer any questions, and my cell phone is on the web. I'm available seven times, seven days a week, 24 hours, 360, and happy to answer any questions. Have a good day, thank you. Thanks, V. So just one last item, um, just remember, uh, these are personal devices, so please don't pass them around between different people because there is a risk of infection. We don't need to, to, to have pneumonias either. Um, but uh, again, you know, use these as much as you can. As V mentioned, um, you know, the, this is really an investment. You know, sometimes you don't necessarily see it immediately, but it's really important, and, and it really does make a difference, which is why we try to recommend these. So um, thank you again to Michelle and IFO PA for providing these. Good morning, everyone. So Michelle asked me to talk about kidney stones in FOP. And um, personally, I suffer from kidney stones, or at least have over the years. And so this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart and, and my kidneys, actually. Um, so um, earlier this year, uh, Fred and I published a paper looking at the prevalence of kidney stones in uh, patients with FOP. and uh, we, we uh, derived the data from two different sources. In uh, 2004, there was a, uh, a global questionnaire asking patients about uh, 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 whether or not they had ever suffered from kidney stones, uh, and that involved over, I believe, over 300 patients uh, worldwide. And then uh, with the uh, Clementia Natural History Study, we had another data set to confirm the original results. And uh, both studies were remarkably similar in that uh, um, we could conclude that, that patients with FOP are three times more likely to suffer from kidney stones than uh, unaffected individuals. So that is a tremendous, uh, 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 tremendously high risk. Now, the study really um, uh, could not definitively state the, the reason why uh, the, the prevalence of kidney stones uh, is so high. Um, a formal possibility is that it may have to do with the ACV, ACV or one mutation, but I think a more likely explanation is that it's related to the mobility status. So if you're immobilized, 
you're less likely to be able to um, you know, have access or easy access to um, things like um, uh, drinking adequate fluid, less likely to uh, want to um, go to the bathroom, uh, to, uh, to urinate. Um, and we do have some associ uh, associative uh, information that um, support what I just said. So in the, in the 2004 study, the majority of, of, of patients, or at least a, a, um, uh, a preponderance of, of patients who suffered kidney stones also had a higher degree of immobility. In the Clementia Natural History Study, we didn't have that same information, but we were able to use a surrogate marker for immobility um, in um, the, uh, what we call the CAGES score or CAGES scale, which uh, I think many of you may, may know that uh, this is a scale which uh, assesses uh, joint function uh, uh, globally, so it's a it's it's a scale out of uh, out of a total of 30 points. The higher the points, the the greater the the immobilization. So so uh, again, it's a, an association. But nevertheless, in both the 2004 study and in the 2016 data that um, Clementia generously shared with us, uh, we were able to uh, make an association between the incidence of or the prevalence of kidney stones and um, uh, mobility status. So why is this important? It's important for several reasons. One is the, as I said, the prevalence is incredibly high, threefold increase. Um, it's, uh, it's potentially preventable. And uh, the symptoms of kidney stones can sometimes mimic those of a flare-up. Um, probably the distinguishing feature here is that with kidney stones, it's, the pain is more colicky. Uh, there, there tends to be some radi radiation into the groin area, uh, but nevertheless, for the, for those reasons, um, um, uh, I think it's important to 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 realize that um, uh, if you have FOP, you're at much greater risk. So, what can we what recommendations can we make, especially for pr uh, prevention? I think, regardless of the composition of kidney stones, there are several things that you all can do. Uh, the, first, um, the first thing is to have adequate fluid intake. There have been uh, a few uh, recent studies which have looked at just fluid intake. And fluid intake by itself, if you're able to uh, drink uh, one and a half to two liters a day, uh, substantially, uh, substantially reduces the likelihood. What else can you do? Uh, you can uh, avoid high protein diets. You can avoid high salt diets. The next recommendation you'll think is really counterintuitive, uh, but it's not. So uh, people think that if you suffer from kidney stones, and kidney stones are predominantly composed of calcium, that one way to avoid them is to reduce calcium from your diet. That's absolutely not true. The opposite is actually true. If you reduce your calcium intake, uh, you actually uh, will precipitate uh, the likelihood of additional kidney stones. Now, let me qualify what I mean. If you're taking excessive amounts of calcium, yes, of course, that can precipitate kidney stone formation. But what I'm talking about is purposely avoiding calcium in your diet. So you want to maintain no normal calcium intake even if you suffer from kidney stones. Um, and I guess the last, the last recommendation um, I, I can make is if you do know the composition of your kidney stones, then there would be more specific dietary modifications that you, you could make. Uh, most people suffer from calcium oxalate kidney stones. And so um, if you, like me, uh, love nuts and green leafy vegetables, uh, you'll have to reduce your intake of those sorts of food. Unfortunately, things like uh, chocolate uh, is also on that list, and so, um, you know, you have to, <laughs> you have to weigh your, your, uh, your life decisions in, 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 that sort of, in that sort of way. So um, I think I've, I've given you an overview of, of, of why 
uh, it's important to uh, practice prevention, uh, preventative measures, some general guidelines uh, as to how to go about doing that. But if you have specific questions, uh, I'd be happy to, uh, to take those either now or you can grab me at any time you see me during the, the next uh, day or so. Thanks. So now we are opening it up to questions from the audience. We have um, until 11, so just a little under 30 minutes um, to take your questions. Yes, so once you have spinal fusion in 1976, I understand the lungs are important, but I also understand keeping the trunk straight is important to that. As far as scoliosis comes to play, to a lot of people as you grow. And I know that surgery is invasive, but what's the possibility of having young kids that start going through puberty wear a Milwaukee brace or wear something that would be helpful in keeping the trunk straight? So it would be that invasive, but helpful as the spine grows. I mean, I know that invariably calcification will be in the spine, but I'm just concerned about the keeping the trunk straight. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jessica. Uh, let, me, let me take a stab at that first. It's a great question. Back in, in the early 1990s, a uh, medical student by the name of Binny Shah and I uh, looked at, examined all the records of the patients who had had surgery back in the uh, earlier 70s, very early in the 70s and the 60s and the 50s, even going back to the 1940s uh, for scoliosis. And we concluded from interviews with the patients and the doctors that, um, that the bracing didn't work. It was too cumbersome. And the surgery at that time uh, really was um, a, a too in very invasive and led to the stimulation, in, in, not in everybody, but in, in a number of patients, other problems. No, no, let, let me. And, and also the knowledge of anesthesia uh, in FOP patients wasn't what it is now. And so we recommended, so we, we published a paper about scoliosis and recommended that at least for the time being, that intervention not be done. Now, over the past 20 years, we've learned a lot more. You're absolutely right. We've learned a lot more about pulmonary health. We've learned a lot more about the natural history of FOP. And we've also seen, um, and we've also learned from you that when you do have procedures or uh, falls or injuries during a quiescent period, it seems to be, again, seems to be less likely that you'll have a flare-up during that time, which is, which is translated to us as, gee, you know, there are times when the same injury is likely going to cause a flare-up and at other times not cause a flare-up. So there's a sensitivity. With that, with the, uh, with, with the knowledge of the pulmonary uh, health and the anesthesia, which has evolved greatly, uh, thanks to SVI over the years, we've, we've begun to re-examine this. We haven't published anything yet, so we haven't seen anything. But I can tell you that I have had two patients, two young women, who've reached a puberty and have had a rapid progression of their scoliosis. I've uh, consulted with Dr. Paul Sponseller, who's here in, in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins. He's the chairman of uh, pediatric orthopedics, especially spine surgery at Johns Hopkins. And in those two uh, situations, we've really examined very, very closely what is the risk of progression in these women, because they've rapidly progressed during uh, early puberty, and what is the risk of not doing the surgery? And both of the young women have undergone uh, corrective surgery. Both are extremely happy. It was a very big procedure. Uh, there were risk factors involved. There were complications involved. But thankfully, both of the young women have, um, have had the procedure, have a, a, a remarkable correction in their spine deformity because it was correctable. Um, and at least in part, a great uh, addition to their pulmonary health. That doesn't mean that this is a panacea for everybody. And we're really looking at this now. We just have one year follow-up on one patient, two years on another. 
Um, we've had several patients since then that have been evaluated by Dr. Sponsell or myself and others, and we felt that it would not be in their best interest to have the surgery. It would be too risky. So it, as, you're absolutely right. This is a really important point, and we, we, we would like to, uh, we'd like to proceed with caution there and report the findings. This also raises the other question about uh, uh, could it, you know, is it possible to, uh, to do the surgery without triggering heterotopic ostication at other sites. So in both of those situations, the young women were quiescent for many years. And their scoliosis progressed, not because they formed more bone, but because they had asymmetric fusion of where the ribs join the spine in the back. And then you superimpose growth on that, and you're going to get a progression of the curve. So, uh, so yes, you're right. And eventually, if we have uh, drugs that are really, really uh, capable of pro prohibiting heterotopic ossification, perhaps that won't become so much of an issue anymore. We'll still be faced with the anesthesia issues, but uh, we'll be able to do that with, we'll be able to do such surgery with more alacrity. So the, the short answer to the question is, um, uh, this isn't chiseled and sewn. We, we're revisiting this on a case-by-case -case basis. And, um, that's all I can say right now. Can, can I add something to this to keep the tongue straight? straight. When you are uh, doing breathing exercise and strengthening the diaphragma and expand the lungs uh, under the ribs, you will also keep the trunk straight. You, you become stronger and the diaphragma also connect with the core muscles and also the hip muscles. So if you just start to play with your kids standing on one leg, it will help them get stronger in the core muscles, the hip muscles, they get the balance, and you keep them look up. And so this is all connected. And th that's a simple way to start to play with the kids in early age. Yeah. And uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's my impression from what I'm learning is that cellular hypoxia plays some kind of a role uh, with an inflammatory response and flare-ups. Now, this makes me wonder, uh, is there any relation to at what altitude you live or travel? Well, there's a big difference between uh, Baltimore and uh, Denver, for example, or traveling from the Rhine Valley up into the Alps. And also, I mean, I've done medevac work with brain injuries, and we've had to fly at low altitude for that reason. Uh, what about uh, commercial air travel uh, for uh, people with FOP? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we haven't seen, we haven't looked um, at that level, but we haven't seen any signals from you know patients who are coming from higher altitudes that they have a problem. Um, what, what we're talking about mainly is uh, cellular hypoxia, really severe hypoxia that's caused by um, or triggered by inflammation. And uh, so the cells are further away from their blood vessels. And w we have you know, direct evidence that there's dramatic uh, hypoxia, dramatic lower oxygen tension in those cells, which triggers a certain molecule called HIF1-alpha, which is produced, it doesn't trigger it, it's actually produced all the time in every cell. But it's broken down. It's kind of kind of a, like a Rube Goldberg machine, <laughs> and then um, at lower oxygen, the the cellular response to degrading that HIF1 alpha is impaired, and that HIF1 alpha protein then re-enters the nucleus, and Im immediately is available for triggering a response. Under normal conditions, that response is helpful, and it enables the cell to survive under under. Um, under low oxygen conditions. But uh, in the setting of an FOP flare-up, what happens is it impairs the receptor from going to the garbage disposal. And so that receptor sticks around a lot longer and keeps on signaling. So it dramatically amplifies the response. And interestingly, you don't need BMP and you don't need active. And once that uh, response is is triggered. You need you need the BMP. You need the activin especially to trigger it. But once it's triggered, uh, once that hypoxia response is triggered, it keeps going and going and going. So um, so 
Uh, the short answer is we haven't seen any, any physiological uh, differences in air travel, in altitude, uh, ambient altitude, et cetera. But we, have, we do see a difference in the tissues that are affected by flare-ups. Along, just, along this, yeah, sorry, just one comment about that. So in patients, though, that are currently on oxygen or requiring CPAP or BiPAP, they do need an approval by their pulmonary doctors before they can go on flight. So that's a separate issue, uh, more so than uh, in, you know, inducing flare-ups, which we have not seen it from patients flying or la living in different con countries. Um, has anyone done any studies on a hyperbaric oxygen on a patient or mice going through flare-ups? Or is there any thoughts of doing any That's of these a studies? good question, Arkin. No, the answer is no, we haven't yet. Yeah. Um, most, of the, most of the approaches have been to use inhibitors of that HIP1 alpha response, uh, it, more of a chemical pharmacological approach, uh, either through, you know, in experimental animals through PX478 or, or apigenin, and Bob is uh, studying other, other drugs uh, that may. Uh, m you know, may inhibit that response. Imatinib partially inhibits that response. It partially inhibits the mast cells. Other other things that we um, uh, other targets that are off target for its primary response in cancer therapy, but not off target for FOP. So, but that's a it's a good question. We we have not looked at uh, hyperbaric oxygen in that setting. So I have a question from Helen Bedford Gay across the pond. She messaged me and asked me to ask um, a question. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about if we think there is any link between FOP and puberty and the increase of flares during puberty. I think Mona and Ed should tackle that as <laughs> endocrinologists. <laughs> um, potentially, yes. So is the short answer. So I think, you know, as, as uh, Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Pignolo have uh, described in, in some of their natural history study data as well as uh, just sort of observational data, there does seem to be a period of relative quiescence uh, in the early childhood uh, in many of the FOP patients in that uh, usually when, they, when the patients start to enter uh, puberty or the early phases of puberty, uh, there are a number that uh, we have heard about uh, that do have an increase in uh, flare activity and uh, FOP-related disease activity. So there is potentially a, a, a connection. Uh, it would not be a complete surprise because a lot of things change during puberty, uh, and um, a lot of things related to bone formation also change during puberty. Uh, so there, there are things that, that um, th there is a potential mechanistic link that, that could be present. Um, and well, is there anything else? Yeah. No, I, I guess just, yeah, I guess there's some people can have more flare ups during the time of puberty. However, going through puberty is a normal process and it's important and it's important for bone health. And so we're not going to be recommending uh, stopping someone from going through puberty um, to prevent that, but it's uh, definitely something that um, to think about. Um, I don't think, and I don't know, maybe someone else can comment about that, but initiation of oral contraceptives, we have not seen more flare-ups with that. I don't think so. Yeah, so yeah. in, and, in, and in, in fact, a separate way, so someone going through puberty, there's a lot of hormonal changes that are happening. However, when our FOP patients have initiated oral contraceptives with estrogen and progesterone, we have not seen more flare-ups happening during the initiation of oral contraceptives. Mm -hmm. And at least in, in some young women, if, if the flares are particularly bad because of either uh, menstrual periods or because of what's going on uh, in later phases of puberty after development has occurred, then we may consider whether oral contraceptives or, or at least estrogen supplementation, hormone replacement types of therapy or hormone supplementation therapy, I guess, at that point, uh, is appropriate um, to try to help try to tampen things down. Um, I, I should add that um, as far as we know, um, uh, the, the, there are a number of patients who report these changes that, that occur during puberty and, and that um, there are increased flares that can be present. Um, but that is not a guarantee or a predictor of anything that happens in the future. Uh, and so there are, uh, you know, you could have really significant numbers of flares that occur during the early phases of puberty that go away. And um, there are patients who 
are totally fine through puberty and then uh, things happen later. So um, it's unfortunately something that we can't predict particularly well yet. I have a question over here. Uh, so as far as puberty with the uh, children, um, and they both have different types of hormones, boys and girls, does it affect one more than the other as far as uh, you, you know, the, the effectiveness of the FFP on the children with their, uh, with their puberty as far as what hormones do boys carry as opposed to what the girls carry? Or is it effective evenly throughout all children? So um, there is no known sex difference uh, in terms of the, the presentation of the FOP. Uh, and so I don't think that that makes much of a, um, at least whether it's a boy or whether it's a girl, I, I don't think that that uh, has any predictive value. So, um, I, Fred, I, I don't know yeah, if you have. I, I, I agree, Ed. And um, the other thing, the other thing seems to be that uh, some ch some children sail through puberty and it's, it's just totally innocuous. It's as if it wasn't even there. It wasn't even an issue. There's no activity and, and they sail through puberty and they don't have any problems and something else happens or, you know, later that they have a flare up. And other other children hit puberty and it's like hitting a wall. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And there's so far... Um, we go. We haven't been able to really pinpoint any any you know or predict who's going to have a problem at puberty and who's not. Um, it's kind of it's one of the still one of the mysteries of FOP. We don't know. Um, on the other end of the cycle, when you start going through menopause for the ladies. I've noticed with Jessica, there's a lot of flare-ups going on uh, continuously. So is there any studies underway to try to find out? Or has anybody else in the FOP society had the same issues? Um, could it be that one of the hormones in maybe a cellular level uh, through either the thalamus or the hypothalamus is causing right. it to trigger? I, Joe, that's a great question. I'm, I'm not aware of any such studies, but I think with the register, this, this is a great example of how you all and how the entire community can participate in research. One of the things we, we, we could do is go to the registry and ask the registry uh, that those data uh, for people at uh, different age ranges, especially women after the menopause, to see if there's an increase versus prior to the menopause. So we have the actual data and perhaps some trends will come out there. That's one thing where, this inter where the international registry can be extremely helpful in, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, in informing us about that, so thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that 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 um, you know for these questions for which we have no data, uh, sometimes the 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 registry um, has not formulated questions that that can uh, can can address those mm -hmm. questions specifically. But this feedback will allow us to go back, and every time the registry is updated, we could include new questions that can um, uh, focus a little bit more on um, especially uh, gynecologic issues uh, from, you know, from our recent discussions, but, but this is a, a great way to um, inform the next, uh, the next version of uh, what the registry will, will look like. So also from Helen, she's been very busy. Um, she, the question she asked was about, um, is there any increased risk to FOPers from chicken pox or shingles? So I, I guess, you know, if chicken pox can be reactivated into shingles, and so sometimes when you're older, you're at increased risk of having reactivation of the chicken pox and getting shingles. Uh, but anytime you're immune compromised, uh, there's always an increased risk of activation of the shingles. So sometimes if someone's hospitalized or acutely sick, there's always an increased risk of reactivation of the chickenpox virus. Uh, if someone's on high doses of glucocorticoids or prednisone, um, then there could be a potential, potentially increased risk of reactivation of the chickenpox virus into the shingles. 
I'm not, I'm not aware that, um, that those particular viruses simulate flare-ups, but I, I, I do know that uh, influenza can. Influenza can simulate. Influenza, it's a deadly disease, whether you have FOB or you don't. So it's a very dangerous condition. But uh, wh whether it's from the viruses infecting the muscle cells, whether it's the cytokines, the, the inflammatory um, chemicals that are circulating through the body, uh, whether it's from the coughing and the expansion of the ribs and the stre stress on the muscles with the flu that causes the flare-ups, we, we really can't separate it, that out at this time. Uh, but we do know that influenza and para-influenza are associated with flare-ups of FOP, all in addition to life-threatening uh, problems uh, with FOP. So we know that for sure. We also know that um, um, Epstein-Barr virus is a particular, I, I don't know why, but it's a particular uh, trigger for FOP. And in some people, it's a major, major issue, you know, with mono, et cetera. And others, in most people, uh, most of us in this room have had it, been exposed to it, not had a major, you know, as children. And, and that leads to the question, could there be some minor viral uh, illnesses that run through a household? And where a parent might say, oh, yeah, my, my child was a little bit out of sorts for a day or so, and, you know, a healthy kid, and, and, you know, they're fine. I don't know what. And, you know, we don't usually measure viral titers for that, but they could have been infected with some, you know, uh, seemingly um, innocuous <laughs> virus, if, 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 if that's an oxymoron, where is in the setting of FOP, uh, that could trigger, that might, that might trigger a flare-up. So, um, but for chicken pox and shingles, I haven't noticed anything in particular. And I haven't noticed anything in particular with the chicken pox uh, vaccinations. Have you had uh, that? Uh, no, I, I don't think we, I, I don't think there's a lot of data out there. So this is one of those challenges. Um, but at least with the, the chicken pox vaccinations, um, when it's given subcutaneously and in patients who have not, or in children who have, are not actively flaring that there is not a, right. uh, an issue. I think yeah. you know one of the things and since we're talking a little bit about vaccinations, um, you know it's it's obviously a, a very personal choice and, and a decision, uh, you know that that is made as a as a team. Um, but uh, one of the things to to really keep in mind is that uh, we do not do vaccinations uh, during a flare or or in the in the area in the time period immediately after a flare. Uh, because that, that, regardless of the type of, right. of vaccination um, or the route, uh, does uh, seem to be associated with an increased risk of flare. I, I completely agree with that. And, you know, even, even safe vaccinations, otherwise you would never, never give a vaccination if a child is having uh, a flare-up. Um, uh, you will be very pleased, I think, to see a... Uh, a very thorough update of the influenza immunization section and the non-influenza immunization section in the next edition of the treatment guidelines, which, you know, as I said, will hopefully go online within the next month or month and a half. Uh, and thanks to, to Ed and Dr. Kitterman, Dr. Joseph Kitterman, who many of you know from San Francisco, um, have really labored uh, intensively on that aspect uh, going to the CDC even, then having, trying to have discussions with them on these issues. And, and how's the window, so there's a window after the, how would you tell the country? Um, typically, I recommend about a month, so about four to five weeks. Um, I think, Mona, you said yeah, about, yeah, about yeah. four to six weeks. Yeah. Six weeks. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's really, it's really making sure, you know, what we have noticed in, in many people is, with FOP is that the flares can sometimes, at least symptoms can sometimes reemerge about two weeks later for unclear reasons. Uh, and so what we really wanted to do is make sure that things are calm and, and really out of, the, uh, out of that acute inflammatory phase. Right. Um, yes, we have, um, Sophia has a chronic wound that um, uh, we've been treating every day for over a year now. and. Um, she was wondering whether she should have a tetanus shot, and then is a tetanus shot effective given sub-Q? Uh, as far as I'm aware, tetanus shots cannot safely be given sub-Q, and even those who've had sub-Q tetanus shots uh, incidentally 
have reported severe reactions to them. So um, we don't recommend that uh, for anybody prophylactically. If someone who has FOP has a tetanus prone wound, there are other things that they may do, like they may get immune globulin either intramuscularly in certain areas uh, or IV. Um, but uh, I, 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 I really don't suggest that people, I, that folks with FOP get a tetanus shot. Yeah, I, at least on a routine basis, we don't right. recommend the tetanus right. shot. There are certain situations, like if somebody steps on a rusty nail, you know, where you have to go down that route, the, the risk of tetanus is extremely high then we have protocols for recommending how to get the tetanus shot in, in combination with different steroids and medications. Um, it, it's a good question. I think the main thing is that uh, for, for patients who have, uh, are at risk of skin breakdown or who have skin breakdown is to really get into a wound care clinic um, as quickly as possible and as early as possible, uh, especially sort of for prophylactic types of, of um, strategies. Uh, I, I didn't talk about it earlier, and I can show you a little bit later. Um, this is uh, one that I actually recommend for a couple of people. You can buy it really cheaply on, on Amazon, uh, even though I, I, I'm not promoting Amazon. Um, but it's called Duoderm, um, and, and it's basically a, um, a, a, a plastic hydrogel that can be used to protect skin areas that are at risk. And the nice thing about this is that you know, if, it's, if you put it on while the skin is clean and, and not at risk of infection, it can really be used as a way, it, it can stay on for like uh, five to seven days. And so you don't, you're not dealing with trying to peel it off or anything like that. But it allows you to actually protect regions that you know, might be pressure points that might have, have higher risk. Um, you don't want to use this on infected wounds. Uh, and so that's where the wound care teams actually become really critical, is that they can help with keeping the wounds clean, keeping them dry, trying to maximize the healing. And it's a challenge. It's, it's not easy because there's always pressure points, especially with li little spicules of bone. And then also the oxygenation uh, you know, and, and respiratory and, and nutritional complications that can be present. So uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to try to address. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I think you get the last question down there. With the, uh, with the two breathing devices that you had showed earlier, the incentive spirometer seemed like it was a slow and steady thing, and the uh, peak flow meter seemed like you needed it to uh, get it to whistle. Was there a preference in the two, and uh, with the peak flow meter, what is the ideal number? Because I, I noticed that you said it gauged. Um, what is the ideal number that you would want to blow? Okay, so, so um, the, the, the challenge with the peak flow meter is that, there, well, for most kids, the kids don't really like doing the incentive spirometer because it's kind of boring. And it requires a level of control of, of being able to inspire deeply uh, and slowly. Uh, that is not easy for children. Uh, and so that's why we were talking about the peak flow meter. The peak flow meter, um, the best thing to do is really to just set it to the lowest part because the goal of the peak flow meter um, normally in asthma is to measure how fast that how fast you can expire. Um, in our purpose, we're not using it for that. We're using it as a way of in, in encouraging kids to actually take a deep breath. So it's actually the deep breath step beforehand, which we're not measuring or doing anything about, but it's that deep inhalation step at the beginning that is actually the most important. So leaving it at the lowest setting is probably fine. Uh, it's, it's really just to, just to get the kids to, to blow through something, you know, to make, trying to encourage them to, to take a deep breath. Um, all of these, if you look online, all of these will have instructions on how to set them in terms of targets and things like that. All of those bets are off in FOP because we're talking about something totally different, um, you know, in terms of the goal. Uh, if you do really, really absolutely want to set them with a target, then um, that should be done in conjunction with a pulmonologist um, because you would probably need formal incentive spirometry first. Uh, to, to really set the numbers. Um, but again, the goal here is not, you know, this is not a competition. This is not trying to, um, you know, see that you, know, you can blow air faster than somebody else. Uh, the goal here is for each individual to, to really take deep breaths and try to, you know, maintain respiratory health as best as possible. 